Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful introduction. I hope I'm audible at the back as well. Yeah, so first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers here, uh, our Honorable Principal Sir, Vice Principal Ma'am, and colleagues from this institute as well as neighboring institutes. Um, it is indeed a pleasure and I would like to start my presentation by thanking the elders and the ancestors upon whose shoulder we basically stand upon. And without them, without their understanding of land and history, it's nearly impossible for any of us to be here. So uh, thanks again for giving me this platform. Uh, in this lecture, basically, I will share a bit of uh, Digital Humanities uh, initiative that I have been able to do so uh, in a very small way. But also, I would like to share my experience in doing this work. And perhaps it uh, will also give uh, importance to here in Sikkim as there are many indigenous populations here and very culturally diverse and involving people which I think it's very important for us to give importance for our nation, not only our nation, definitely it should have a global presence. As my previous speaker has also spoken about uh, different kinds of initiatives, I will also talk about different initiatives and how we can take these initiatives. Uh, a second part of my talk will be a bit of a technical uh, session where I will talk how to build your lab and what are the different um, resources that you will be needing. And uh, practically, uh, when we have, we usually have all the resources that we want, we don't know how to channelize it. So um, one of the very first questions uh, that came into, uh, that I heard was me coming from a oceanography and biological <coughs> background. How do I do digital humanities and how do I walk through it? So um, it is something that I have experienced. From my own experience, I say that it is something that everyone from all disciplines can do and contribute and it will be a much engaging interaction, a discipline, a very interdisciplinary purpose uh, that can be solved through digital humanities. And I'll show you some uh, examples of that as well. So the next slide. So uh, the things that we'll be talking about today was uh, the digital humanities is introduction. My previous speaker has delved into it very deeply. So I'll not go mu into much detail about it. But what I'll be talking about are archives, what are archives, and how is it associated with the digital humanities, and of course, the praxis and how we, as uh, people from Sikkim, people from different other parts of the world in different disciplines, can deal with it, can initiate it in our own small or larger ways, as it might be. Next slide. So uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll uh, skip uh, this, but uh, just to give you an idea, the previous one, please. Yeah. So uh, you have learned about uh, the re mission readable formats uh, that can be generated from your own libraries. So uh, if you have libraries here, at the libraries in different parts of the world, they uh, they hold different kind of resources. Right, which are not necessarily available uh, to all of us. So, I mean, me myself coming from a minority community, uh, it's very difficult to get held, hold of books because publishing itself has not been in such a you know mega scale that it will be profitable and many many books books will be published. Perhaps uh, just to give you an example, that only one book had been published, only 500 copies. So, in say 1980. So coming in 2023, you will hardly find any presentation of those books. So if someone has to refer to that kind of book, it is important that we try and digitally preserve that so that in the coming generations as well, we get to understand what was there in the book. 
not only books, look at what we are surrounded with. We are surrounded with leaflets, calendars, pamphlets, uh, in your own institutions, the history of the institution as it is, as it were, in, in so many decades, pe so many people's effort has been given into it. We all have emails, so uh, many a times we think that um, you know the, the old copies, old books, brochures are the only endangered things. But uh, that is not what it is. Now we are living in a digital age. We know whatever we do have a digital footprint in it, right? So even if we delete a mail, right? Even if we say delete everything in our spam, sorry, something or the other of a digital footprint is definitely there. But it is as much as you know, ephemeral in a way that you will not be able to retrieve the deleted mails very easily. So those are also I mean, now some some initiatives are also now there which uh, which try to look at endangered digitally born material. But most of uh, the work uh, that we do is uh, mostly and even the previous speaker that spoke about are mostly materials which are not digitally born. Yeah, next please. So what are archives? So how many are you of are you are acquainted with this term? Archives. What is an archive? Yes, I see some a couple of yes. Oh sure, sure, sure. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. So uh, the archive basically derives from the word archaea, as you can see. And definitely, uh, this is something which is a culmination. And you can also have rare materials in the library, in your archive. And you can build archives of many things, as many things such as books, uh, music. You can also have archives of um, you know, musical instruments. Uh, and the next slide, please. Yes, so basically if I say that this is a collection of so many things, how is it then different from a library? So what do you think? Any responses? So how is an archive? I see you uh, said that you know what an archive is. So do you think that archive and a library is same? How is it different? Most of your teachers are not around. So no one is going to complain. Go ahead and speak. There's no wrong answer. So we are all evolving this idea and we are all grappling with different kinds of ideas together. So, uh, well, I'll go ahead then. Uh, the next. So, in case of the earlier one, please. Yes. So, this is something called the first hand information and the kind of arrangement that you have. These and definitely the accessibility which uh, is very different when you are looking at an archive and when you are looking at a library. So if you have a library and you have some sections which are very uh, scarce material that's in, within there, it's not possible to give it away to everyone. So it is preserved separately in a separate section in a very, um, uh, you know, very protective way. And perhaps those are the ones we would be looking at while doing things digital. So, or even trying to preserve them digital. So, apart from that, an archive definitely, like uh, in a library, you will have catalogs, right? All libraries have catalogs. And what are the, uh, you know, things that are present in the catalog? What are the informations that are present? So those are the name of the authors, when it was published, uh, which publication house is published, right? In case of an archive, we have something called the metadata. So what is metadata? I will delve with it in details later. But for now, let me just say that metadata is basically the data about a data. So if I am talking about a book, so there will be several other sections that are important, uh, not only the author of the book, but also the material of the book, the condition of the book, the binding of the book, and so on and so forth. So uh, we will look into it 
in detail, so I'm not uh, sharing it now. So next slide, please. So uh, what are the uses of archives? So we are, have been talking about digital humanities and archiving. Uh, you see, like um, when you were, say, everyone is 20, I guess, in this room. So when you were five years old, the world that you see around here, around the place where you were born, and now after, say, um, you know, 15, 17 years later, is it the same? It cannot be the same. Mostly it is not same. So in terms of um, the building that you are living in or the huts that you are surrounded with or even the, the landscape, the number of trees that are around, the number of birds, number of butterflies, uh, even the climate is changing as you very much know and can feel in this room I guess. So, uh, so these are things that are always evolving, that are always changing and each of our experiences are important for each of us, right, living our lives. And what are, what, I mean, it becomes very important, especially uh, when you look at heritage, when you look at cultural initiatives and their representations here and abroad as well. So those are the ones that are necessary when you are archiving. So the more detailed your metadata is, the more accessibility you will have in the long run for its correct representation or understanding of the same. Next. So, who can use an archive? Definitely students and academicians, uh, artists, designers, uh, solicitors, solicitors, developers, architects, anything, like any new name under the sun, whatever uh, profession you are going to take in the coming days, you will always need something you, you need to refer to. So those are the things that can be uh, found in the archives. So even uh, the newspapers that we have uh, in anywhere and everywhere, they have the archives where you can see what happened in 1950, right? What happened in the today itself, I saw a calendar um, of Sikkim, which was of 1961 calendar. So, uh, if you look at, look at the different um, you know associations, even uh, the say the holiday calendars that were there 20 or 50 years ago, are very different from how it is now. So, the whole cultural evolution that it is. Uh, is important for us to access and for any researcher, journalist, students, of course any kind of project. Some of you are from the history department, you will definitely know that you get to, uh, you need to use the different kinds of, um, uh, you know, materials that the kind of master's project or even for your own interest. So, um, in fact, if you uh, look back and uh, talk to your grandparents, uh, the kind of world that they had lived in and the kind of world that you are living in right now, you will have different perspectives. And even uh, there's, there are at times uh, some very um, path-breaking or earth-shattering uh, you know, incidents such as a political movement or even an earthquake per se. So every family who has gone through or even family or even partition, so they have had different kinds of experiences. So it is important that all these voices be heard and talked about and exchanged. So one nation is definitely a very important thing, but multiple voices are equally important. So next, so I'll talk most about uh, also my association with the Jadavpur University School of Cultural Text and Records. So it has been very inspiring in my life, and uh, I have seen projects blossoming under this school and mentors. Uh, I have had been, you know, I'm grateful that I have had mentors who would teach me what digital humanities is and how to work uh, with archiving. So that is where uh, I 
you know, and I, I feel like taking the first steps towards digital humanities. So there are a number of projects, uh, Dex, please, which has been uh, taken by this initiative. If you go online and go to the website uh, Grand Southeast Asia, you will find more details of it. But broadly speaking, uh, in fact, Shantanu has been working with the archives of the North Indian classical music. So we can say that we have a collection of almost 10,000 hours of recorded music um, and which one can uh, go back there, access and listen to it free. And, uh, but the one most uh, thing that is um, you know, a hindrance in a way is this is not publicly available. It is not for the university who, to make it public. So if one has to access it, one has to physically travel to uh, Jadupur University and listen to it. But it is accessible. If you come down, you'll be more than glad to uh, curate and cater it to you. Next one, please. So uh, I'll move quickly to indigenous archives. So since I come from uh, the Santali background, so I had always been interested and inquisitive about my heritage and uh, the influences that have had during the colonial period, the missionaries' influences, and such. So the one most um, archive, uh, archive that is dig digitally available is maintained by uh, the Norwegian Institute in Oslo University. And uh, they have had missionaries coming down in 18. 80s, 1890s, who had spent more than 40, 50 years here, and um, during, I mean, around 1940, just pre-independence, they had taken up their collection and went back to their mother nation, Norway. So most of the collections were inaccessible to the people living here. So in spite of uh, the documents being produced and even helped to be produced uh, by the people here were inaccessible. So only after a lot of uh, talk with the governments, two governments, Government of India, Ministry of Culture and the Norwegian government, now after 20, 2010, they have been able to digitize a lot of collection and uh, now around 90% of their collection is available to us. And let me share a bit about uh, that here. So they have two sections, the Santali manuscript section and the cultural heritage section. So they, they not only took books uh, that were published in Norwegian, in Santali, in, um, you know, like uh, in Danish as well, in Danish as well. They also took uh, bangles, cultural artifacts, materials uh, such as uh, you know, jewellery, boxes and those are all now displayed uh, in the Oslo Museum. So the next one. So uh, one of the very interesting manuscripts uh, that were found, uh, that I found is uh, the manuscript on which, based upon which the dictionary, this English Santali dictionary was produced. So it's a seven volume book and uh, the boarding manuscript it is said and one can look at the collection of words that uh, the missionaries had gathered and uh, started writing this huge manuscript based upon which the book was published. Interestingly uh, again, the next one please, this uh, you, you, you should know that Santali is basically an Austroasiatic language and uh, it, is, it has been an oral language till the 1890s. So it's just around 100 years old that writing had started in Santali. And it was done, it was started by the missionaries. So if I were to look at the evolution of writing, the evolution of uh, cultural transmission, the transmission from oral to a written form, you can find clues and uh, I, I find it very fascinating as I find I feel myself like a detective trying to look at different cues and join connecting the dots 
uh, what had happened, say, uh, 150 years ago. So uh, this is an, one document which, uh, which uh, tries to look at the agreement of how Santali shall be written. And the, there were minutes of the meetings, there were people who were, I mean, it's, it's much longer. I'm just uh, showing you a clip of it. Uh, where they look at the Roman alphabet and how it can be, uh, you know, um, twitched with diacritics, uh, with dots and commas, and uh, to to adhere to the Santali pronunciation, which is very much different from the vocal vocabulary of a, you know, of English language or otherwise. Next, please. Yeah. So. Um, with all the support from Jadupur University and my mentors there, uh, I had done a Jian course uh, in 2016 and I had seen that there were uh, projects which are going on which looked at the majority of the community of Bangla literature of Rabindranath Tagore which were, I mean, fascinating. So uh, it, uh, for me, uh, I thought that uh, we should also take up something uh, which is more near and dear to my heart, which is not being done much. And uh, I started writing this project uh, with the help from my colleagues. And uh, incidentally, we got funding from the British Library and uh, from the Endangered Archives program. So uh, I see people here in the Northeastern region also uh, have so many cultural diversity which are which is much not represented and is very fast changing so i really hope that people would write to the endangered archive programs at jadapur university we now have an hub called the um, called the eap hub where we uh, regularly do trainings online trainings offline trainings for people uh, especially from our nation to write projects and uh, how to how to write the projects? What are the important um, things that people look up? How to do the budget and such? So we will be very happy to uh, you know accommodate and uh, curate such a session for uh, people here as well. So uh, so this the, the the you know this is uh, this the every AP project has a number. Mine was thirteen hundred. So that is why it's written AP thirteen hundred. Next one, please. These were my teammates, my uh, research scholars, uh, Shruto Kirti Dotto, Shita Ram Bashke, and Amritesh Vishas. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to finish this project. We went to different places of uh, our nation, Odisha, especially in uh, Jharkhand, in uh, Bihar, in Bengal, in different parts of Bengal. And we collected materials, digitized them. I'll show you how we did, did that. Next, please. These were some of my field collaborators, and uh, the 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 this the library that you see, uh, and the, on top of that you can see a script written. That is the all Chiki script in which Santali is written. Uh, you might uh, be interested in looking up uh, the all Chiki script. It has its own movement as it is, which I'll not delve into it. Next. Yeah, so these are some of the documents uh, we did um, digitize. So the first one is uh, the um, Susar Dahar. This is a periodical which was published uh, between 1970s. And the next one you can see is called Dharva. So Dharva it has 32 volumes and it was published from 1931 from our collection. So uh, this is a typical way of how to uh, capture the images. Um, so you can see that the British Library has specific instructions. So this is uh, a black background which uh, needs to be uh, kept, on which the book needs to be kept. And uh, do you have any idea, people interested in photography might have idea, what are the colorful uh, you know, slip of paper that is seen there? Any idea what it is? No responses. Okay, fine. So uh, this is called a color checker. So this is um, available from Kodak. And uh, the importance of this is when you see old papers, so they change, they tend to change colors, right? 
so it can be white uh, and after 50 years it can turn yellow or it can turn brown so the type of paper the in fact uh, the ink used depending upon that see in the first um, uh, you know like the first picture you can also see that someone had written something on it and then there's a white ink on top of it right so all these things all this information needs to be there for anyone because uh, anyone to understand because you see like um, when i am physically looking at a book i have a different kind of experience but when i am seeing the digital copy of the book then i'll have a different kind of experience so i don't have that tangible experience that i have when holding a book right so the best we can do for a very rare and fragile uh, document is to uh, put in all as much as detail as possible in a uh, digital platform so next one so uh, this you can see is a biography of uh, Campbell, Andrew Campbell, a very important missionary at that time. And the next one you can see is uh, Chhotrai Deshmukh Katha. Many of you must have heard of many um, insurgencies and revolutions that had taken place during the colonial rule, um, opposing the British to come into uh, the land and the East India Company as well. So one such uh, initiative was the Santal Bull of 1855, uh, which you can understand uh, is much earlier than the Sepoy mutiny that we hear is the first revolution. But I'm sure you know other revolutions as well, which were uh, which are given less importance. Uh, but anyway, Chhotrai Deshmukh Katha earlier one, please. So Chhotrai Deshmukh Katha is one such book which uh, is very one of his kind like we talk about oral history initiatives so this person Chotrai Deshmaji was a young person of 13 or 14 years old when this revolution happened so after the revolution he was sort of had to flee that place he came to Assam which is much nearer here so when this person was 85 years of age then it was decided that I mean what he had experienced should be documented so but he had no idea how to read and write so what he did was uh, he narrated whatever he remembered to a person called Raya Sholin and this person wrote down this book and in a form of conversation and an oral narrative that is that is now we can see as an indigenous perspective to the whole that has happened because till now most of the um, you know narratives that are present are colonial narratives so most of the uh, you know if you look at our histories so it's a radical ch change and transformation in understanding how we look at the politics of our nation how do we look at uh, history of our nation and multiple voices are much more important than to hear only one voices or only one uh, narrative of a particular incident so these are some things yes uh, uh, when was this book published I yeah this was published uh, in the 19 1990s i guess yes later in assam in assam yes so uh, this was uh, again a missionary publication initially but there have been reprints uh, of this book later as well next one please so similarly uh, santali being a very um, you know a language which is spoken over different states so in bihar bengal odisha in assam as you as you just heard so book publications has been done in different languages in different scripts uh, and uh, these are some of the examples for that so uh, hor shambad is one such something uh, printed in Devanagari. Next. So uh, quickly I'll show you how do we do things at uh, the School of Cultural Text and Records. This is a short video of the setup uh, through which, so these are the materials uh, needed. The first one is the scale, the brush, scissors, measuring tape, uh, the brushes <coughs> and this is a book this is one of my colleague Omritesh that you saw so this is a book that we are going to digitize and we did a fast forward thing for you to see so this is the camera setup which is 
basically hung upside down this is the camera and this is the book you can see the scale that is needed and also note that he is wearing gloves right so uh, it's important to protect the document that you are uh, digitizing and we do not click the shutter directly we do it through a computer so uh, the camera shutter is uh, attached with the computer you can you will be able to see in just a minute so so this is how the setup is done and uh, this is basically an acid free paper which uh, you will keep it in between the pages because many a times old pages tend to be very fragile and there can be holes so you will uh, have problem in seeing the documents or even you will have double documents seen through the pages so then you put a acid free paper which uh, is something um, you know uh, not non corrosive for the material that we are handling so this is uh, basically an all tiki primer and lights are used as you can see in both the sides so these are led lights with the uh, shutters present and you can modify it so this is a soft software again we use uh, while documenting this so we do this in 800 dpi so i mean i i won't be able to go through totally with this but anyone who is interested we can actually sit together and uh, do this and see for yourself so uh, we can set the kind of exposure that we need we can set the camera settings we can focus here and then uh, from here itself from to to take high resolution raw images you will be able to capture here and after that we will do the metadata of the document we will talk about the metadata of the document again uh, i'm telling you in a bit so this is how it is saved acha Uh, another thing that also needs to be kept in mind that uh, all the naming of this uh, of these pages uh, of these images basically will be individual page will be will have a unique number so it will automatically be saved in a folder again which will have a very unique number so we can uh, stop now and uh, we'll move on this has been shared so you can again look at it when you desire yes so uh, this is the metadata uh, i'm sure you can't see that but uh, it's basically a huge excel sheet and in these excel sheets next one please you will have these informations okay so the title the name uh given to the resources or even the name of the book uh in which script this book was written uh translation if it is available and the format in which the images uh you know i mean you know definitely better than me like there are uh, jpeg formats wave formats uh there are tiff formats there are so many formats that pdfs and such files uh those are the information that needs to be there and of course who is collecting where is the source resource available uh you can also go to the british library website that i had shared earlier and look into my project page and see what kind of metadata is present over there it is freely available anyone who is uh interested can look it up and download it and uh, make your own metadata so next one please so now i will talk about a bit of um you know different digital humanities project that i had taken inspiration from so uh, this uh, so so basically what i have been able to do is the step 1 so there are many other step that needs to be done and slowly and slowly i uh, i hope to do so uh, so this is a shakespeare verorium project which uh, you can see that the different books the different i mean it's huge 
right so the different kinds of book that were published in different times of the year one can also uh, start a project perhaps of the translations of books of translations that are available in our nation itself in different uh, different languages and one can look at how has shakespeare been translated so uh, for this purpose to understand shakespeare's publications the the uh, the digital humanities project that these people have taken up is basically looking at uh, the different publications and from different times and different ages so you can see how it how ha it has evolved even if you if one looks at uh, you know different versions i'll state another example next please so uh, if you many of you are acquainted with canterbury tales right so uh, this project when one looks at it uh, one can map basically uh, in relation to one person what will be the uh, what will be the relationship yeah. of that person of that story uh, among different people right so there can be one central character as it is shown in the above diagram and what happens when that central character is removed it's it's uh, it's really funny when you try to do that but then again uh, on a serious note you can also understand who is the one who is having uh, a major role to play and what are what is that person's say socio political association in accordance to the others involved or the other characters in the play and what happens to a minor character which might be very important and very powerful in the discourse so this kind this kind of study can also be done through digital humanities next one please so uh, this was a project uh, taken by professor shukanto choudhury from uh, jadavpur university so it's uh, the tagore veriroyam i was talking about the different versions so what this humongous project had done was uh, next here yeah you so you will be able to see the different versions of poems as it has evolved right so tagore being a person who has uh, written poems written novels short stories plays songs what not and he have had different versions of these poems as well so uh, to just to give you an example if you go into this web page vichitra project and you are able to uh, compare and contrast how the changes of these different points had occurred okay so uh, i'll not delve into much into it if you are interested you can look it up and uh, you know for me i think uh, you know such very interesting uh, case cases and uh, can be done into different other um, uh, you know different other people who had written such poems written such uh, you know stories which are yet to be unraveled next one please so uh, this again i'm coming to uh, chaucer and uh, voltaire uh, so you can see a map here so and there are many many dots right so basically let's see thank you so much yeah so uh we were talking about gis and remote sensing and how it influences our lives so now pre computer age people from the 1700s are also influenced by it so if we look at this map we can see that in in the middle in the in below basically i think it's not you can't see it at the back so i'll read it up for you so there are tabs such as actual places so actual places but no stated stated places true stated places false stated places and these are you can reset the map so basically i have already done this for you so you can actually see what are the places that uh, voltaire's places of publications have been and what are the places that are fictional that have been fictional okay so you can glean 
one layer above the other and try to understand how it has traveled. So uh, I will go to the next one. Yes, uh, to explain that more and uh, definitely my area of interest in Charles Darwin as he had been instrumental in uh, actually going to different places and uh, talking about the evolutionary theory, he have had a lot of backlash in it. But this uh, Digital Humanities project has looked at where he had been, what are the letters that he had exchanged and uh, it's, it's beautiful. I'll, um, I have done a screen grab of that as well. So if you can uh, have the next uh, next slide and then the video, please. Next, next. Yeah, yeah, this one. Next, yes, this one. Just, just for a minute. Yeah. So uh, many of you know that uh, in class uh, class eight or nine, we have read about the voyage of the Beagle, right? This uh, huge voyage that uh, Darwin took from England to different parts of the world and uh, done collections globally uh, of rocks, of minerals, of birds, of uh, butterflies, natural history programs and brought them back to England. So after that he had studied them for more than 20 years before coming up the theory uh, of evolution or even genesis for that matter. So uh, this wonderful project looks at his journey that he had taken and brings together uh, as if we can experience the, the kind of experience that Darwin had had. So, 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 look at, so looking at it, uh, let's see how they have done it. You, I'm sure you will be reminded of uh, video games that you love playing and how you can design uh, your own video games as well. So I know many young people who do that. Uh, yeah, so, so let's look at it. Yes, so if when you click on this, if the book comes, comes up, and then uh, you will see that how Darwin had traveled. So he had started at A coastline of England then you can see the red line traveling to the coasts of South America uh, but he didn't take a stop there this is where he took the stop you can see and the page takes you to the different kinds of activities that he have had done at that place so these are the places where he had collected rocks and um, some feathers he had also received letters at this point. So they have all put this together. And when you, I mean, now 3D scans are easily done. So what this project has done is uh, for you to give you an idea of what the collection looks like. So they have also um, scanned the rock, the sample that was collected in the 1800s. And you can virtually see how it is and how uh, you know it's really doable now believe me you can also do this uh, and there's also a letter that he had received at that point that has also been incorporated in this web page and you can read the letter uh, what happened okay let me so uh, read the letter the kind of communication that he had had at that time and what kind of responses that he got, uh, these are all encompassed in one web page. So definitely it will take time for one, in e one after the other to look into it. But um, you know this is a wonderful way of representing uh, how things work. And yes, uh, the next one. So, so uh, if each one of you in this class uh, classroom basically tries to take up very smaller projects.
say something uh, from your own family or some family history that uh, you feel that needs uh, immediate preservations. People who are say 90, their life histories, uh, their understanding of the world and how it works. And since we are living in this very fast changing world, it is all the more important that the knowledge that is embedded in our cultures, our languages be preserved before we uh, no longer have that in our next generations to come. I'll stop here and I hope uh, uh, we meet again and talk more uh, on this project and the possibilities. Uh, I end by acknowledging uh, my mentor, Professor Shukantul Choudhury, who is Professor Emeritus at Jadhapur University, also the founder of uh, uh, School of Cultural Text and Record. Apart from him, of course, I have had other influences as uh, late Professor Shamuta Tash, Professor Amlanda Shkupto, and of course, my colleagues and friends who have been very supporting uh, and inspiring to start this initiative. Thank you so much.